today's event at the Ada Lovelace Institute um, called Exploring Participatory Mechanisms for Data Stewardship. We are so grateful to have you all here today on what is a very warm day in London, uncharacteristically, and we appreciate you for going the beach uh, and instead being here to join today's event. Um, we are incredibly excited to have you here. I'll start just with a few housekeeping notes and perhaps first by introducing myself. My name is Carly Kind and I'm the director of the Ada Lovelace Institute. Um, you can find uh, on your screen uh, the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. I'm sure you're familiar with it by now where you can submit any questions you might have. Uh, and you can also, of course, find the chat, um, which uh, will help you connect with other participants on the webinar. Your videos aren't visible, um, of course. You can engage in the conversation on Twitter. Twitter, we are at Ada Lovelace Inst, and we're using the hashtag participatory data. There are closed captions available today, and you can turn on subtitles by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and you can also view adjustable, uh, fully adjustable subtitles via stream text. And the link for the stream text will be in the chat imminently. So we are here today um, to launch a new report on the part of the A Lovelace Institute called Exploring Participatory Mechanisms for Data Stewardship. And this report builds on um, a, a, a field of work that Ada has been developing around uh, thinking on data stewardship, what it is and how to put it into practice. We um, are publishing this report as the second in a series. The first was published earlier in the year and was called Exploring Legal Mechanisms for Data Stewardship. And it was based on the work of a working group that looked at three new um, legal frameworks which might be used to support data stewardship, namely data trusts, uh, data cooperatives, and contractual uh, and commercial uh, mechanisms. What do we mean when we say data stewardship? This is uh, can be a contested term, and we've written a blog post on that if you're interested in unpacking uh, the various interpretations of it. But when Ada talks about data stewardship, we mean the responsible use, collection and management of data in a participatory and rights preserving way. So we're really thinking about what makes the use of data trustworthy, um, ethical and responsible. And we believe that it's important to promote data stewardship because we have reached a point in the data ecosystem where there is a lot of uh, tenuous public trust, even distrust in the use of data by organisations, both public and private. Uh, there are exploitative practices out there which undermine not only individual rights, but uh, which impede the ability to use data to benefit society and in particular in the public interest. And we think it's important to think about different processes and practices that can lead to really responsible and trustworthy use and management of data. And we believe that participatory mechanisms is one way in which that end can be achieved. We've seen uh, the use of data high on the agenda, including during the pandemic. And I think it's fair to say that public trust in the use of data, including to tackle the pandemic has um, waxed and waned uh, with various new cycles and interventions, including, for example, the use of data-driven technologies such as contact tracing apps during the pandemic. And of course, we see the impact of large-scale data breaches or other corporate um, misuse of data impacting uh, the use of data, even when it might be in the public interest. So there's a real necessity to try to build more trustworthy practices around data. This report sets out a range of creative mechanisms for how data interventions can be designed um, and, and run in a way that involves people in the use of data. So it involves ordinary people in terms of setting expectations, uh, design, and ultimately empowering them to make decisions and choices about their data. And we think it's really timely, not only for the reasons I've already outlined, but also because we're going to see here in the UK in particular, the question of data governance reopened in the aftermath of Brexit. Um, the, uh, uh, Oliver Dowden has recently announced their intention to run a consultation on reform of data protection legislation in this country. And this means there will be many live debates about how data should be properly governed. And we think there's much more of a role for participatory mechanisms 
uh, in, in data governance going forward. So that's it from me. I'm really happy to pass over to our extremely eminent panel here today. First, we're going to hear from our Associate Director for Public Engagement, Reema Patel, who's the lead author on this report, uh, a participatory engagement guru, and, um, and really the brain behind this thinking. And then I'm excited to introduce to you um, Miranda Walport, who will be um, speaking about the Global Mental Health Data Bank at the Wellcome Trust, Gary Leeming, who will be speaking about Liverpool's new civic data cooperative in the Liverpool city region, and Catherine Riley, who generously is joining us from Vancouver at the horribly early hour of 6am to talk about citizen-centred data audits at Simon Fraser University in Canada and her work in Latin America. Um, we have a pretty tight agenda, so we'll keep it, keep it fast. Um, I'm going to hand over to Rima. You'll then hear from all the panellists and you'll get a chance to ask questions at the end. Um, and given that there's almost 150 of you on this webinar, I expect there'll be some really interesting thoughts. So please do pop them in the Q&A as the speakers are speaking. Okay, over to you, Rima. I think you're still on mute. Hi, sorry. Um, so thank you so much for um, a wonderful introduction, Kylie. I really appreciate that. Um, and also thank you very much to all of our panelists for discussing um, their experiences. So uh, this is a really experiential research report. So that's the first thing to say, drawn from case studies. So um, let's let's have this really lively interchange of ideas on this panel. Um, participatory data stewardship. Um, what is it? Um, our working definition is here. Uh, Carly introduced it earlier. The responsible use, collection and management of data in a participatory and rights preserving way. And there's two ways in which we expand upon this definition in this report. The first is um, the idea that this is a process or an ethos that exists across the data science life cycle on the right hand side. So all the way from collection, processing, um, sharing, deleting, and indeed evaluating the use of the data system. The idea, the notion that data stewardship um, uh, exists and is an ethos that, that should govern the process throughout the data science life cycle. Um, there's also another point which, uh, in which we advance our thinking on data stewardship. Uh, the, this point is about the notion of data stewardship as relational. So in the report, we introduced the concept of a data steward, so a role held by those who are active in processing, gathering and, 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 and um, um, processing and collecting and deleting data during the data science life cycle. And, and then the other um, definition that's introduced is that of the data beneficiary. And here we, we are thinking about this as broader than just the data subject as defined. Um, so for instance, you might well be impacted by a data system, even though you're excluded from that data system, this question of missing data. Um, so we'd count those individuals are still affected, still a beneficiary of a data system, even though they're impacted adversely. Indeed, it's because they're impacted adversely that they're a data beneficiary. And there are other elements as well, such as people who are thinking about working across the data system. Um, so that, that really re reiterates and expands on, on how we're thinking about this and how our thinking has advanced since we last published that blog post. Um, in terms of approaching context, um, we draw mainly from our um, case study review of just over 100 case studies across Europe. And we also draw extensively from, from Sherry Arnstein's um, seminal paper on the ladder of citizen participation. Um, as Carly mentioned, data-driven systems, infrastructure and technologies have become a central part of the way we live and work. Um, the pandemic has made it clear that there are benefits that come from sensitive and thoughtful use of data and management, but has also illustrated the importance of getting data right. Without public confidence and buy-in, data-driven systems won't be able to work in, in an effective manner. And that's why we, we felt it was really important that we, we, we published this report and, and did this research. Um, so why does this matter? Um, and, and here in, in, in the report, we set out this concept of a beneficial feedback loop. So when we have data use and data governance models that are underpinned by a strong sense of trust and confidence, we engender better outcomes, fairer, more equitable outcome, um, and a broader social welfare outcome that are supported by data. And that actually impacts on the way people feel about um, the, the process of data um, um, uh, stewardship itself. Um, it leads to increased social license and active participation in the youth. 
it in turn then leads to more representative, inclusive and proportionate uses, and that um, perpetuates a, a more beneficial feedback loop. The tenuous trust moments that Carly mentioned, um, almost you, you could see that operating in the reverse way. When people feel that data systems aren't working so well for them, um, you might find that they're less confident, less likely to, to want to actively participate and, and shape data systems. So, so that's a kind of articulation of why it is that participatory uh, approaches are really important. And in the report, we set out a framework for participatory data stewardship. Um, and uh, there's a really interesting piece, uh, a quote in, in the paper that I mentioned by Arnstein, where she said there's a critical difference between going through the empty ritual participation and having the real power needed to affect the outcome of the process. And, and we, we might think about and what, what, what did the empty ritual participation look like? And I'm, I'm inviting you to think about this. Um, but for me, it's that process of sometimes I'm um, maybe asked to consent um, or say yes to certain users of my data. So I'm not entirely sure I know how that's happening or what's then happening to it. And, um, the, the classic example is um, cookie notices and, and the way that we access information across the internet. Um, uh, the next question then is what does having real power needed to affect the outcome process mean? And in her paper, um, Arnstein sets out um, several uh, layers, um, so essentially a ladder of participation and then sending um, uh, layers of power associated um, with participation. What we do in this report at the Aid Lovelace Institute is just map those on to um, how we might think about data-driven systems and data-driven technology. So this framework on the right hand side is the Ada Lovelace Institute's interpretation of that framework as it applies to data-driven systems and data-driven technology. First is around informing, we will keep you informed about how your data is being, being governed, a, a promise from the data steward to a data beneficiary. Um, so this, uh, a lot of people are talking about transparency, which explainability is a good example of that. Um, uh, but I'm seeing is, is quite critical of the idea that just informing people is, is the way to, to build that public confidence and buy-in um, and, and, and suggest that there might be a more of a two-way dialogue. Um, so, so there um, you have consultation, which is the listening process, um, and uh, also making sure um, that acknowledging um, concerns as expressed and providing feedback um, and aspirations for the governance of data is, is a useful step on. Um, next, there are examples that relate to uh, working in uh, more collaborative ways. Um, so citizen jury, public deliberation, are good examples of these sorts of approaches, approaches um, user design, um, co-design and so on. These are all set out in the report. Um, uh, instances where um, the data steward will work with um, the data beneficiaries um, to ensure concerns and aspirations are reflected in data, data governing um, and, and actively work in collaborative ways. And really interesting examples here um, um, that we will hear from in terms of best practice and, and, and case study. Um, and uh, the, the, the report explored uh, things such as data donation model, data trusts and cooperatives. Um, and then uh, the, the the, the highest rung of a ladder that Arson talked about um, and that's been adapted here is this, this notion of advising and assisting. So thinking about these roles as almost flipping um, around. Um, so the, the, the leadership comes from the data beneficiary, not the data steward. The data steward is in a much more advisory role in, in this dynamic and, and this relationship. Um, so uh, what's really interesting about all of this is it's much more about the ethos and the culture and the approach embedded within the data system than it is just about mechanisms and the tools, although we do set out and map out a range of mechanisms and tools. Um, so that's enough for me in terms of introducing the thinking behind this research report. Um, do, do take a look at it. Um, and I, I just wanted to hand back to Carly, who will um, introduce our excellent panellists, um, who will be able to speak to um, the involve, collaborate and empower end of, um, of that spectrum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rima, and thank you for running through that in such a concise way. I am pleased now to hand over first to Miranda Walpert, who is the Director of Mental Health at Wellcome and a Professor of Evidence-Based Practice in Mental Health at UCL. And we're gonna hear more from Miranda about the new uh, Wellcome Mental Health Data Bank. So over to you, Miranda. 
Thank you very much. And thank you, Theda Lovelace, for all you do in this area. We really draw on your models and learning and you're doing really important work. So fantastic to see this report come out. Massive learning for us. Um, can you see me? I just sort of suddenly seen this. There's my video working. Yes, it's fine. Uh, so um, uh, I'm a mental health expert and the issues of data, trust and stewardship and mental health are many and varied. One of the issues for us as researchers is that because mental health is deemed highly sensitive data, and in particular because mental health data from children is doubly sensitive, that can actually mean that it limits the use of those data and has a particular complexity for data stewardship models and participation. Um, it looks like some people can only see my name, some people can't see my picture. I don't, I've got major technology problems at this end. My video is showing us on but there's nothing I can do about it. So I'm sorry, you'll just have to imagine, imagine whatever you like to imagine. And um, uh, some people can see me, some people can't. Uh, so uh, I, I have no control over that aspect. So, um, uh, so really for what we're interested in the welcome is thinking about how do we develop models where we are, to advance our research agenda, we need massive amounts of information about mental health data and outcomes and people's experiences that researchers can use to understand what holds people back in life in terms of mental health problems and what can help advance them, what can help cure them, what can help treat them. There, and what we are interested in is, is there a way of doing that in such a way that really empowers those people who are giving their data to actually be actively involved in that research agenda and to make informed decisions about how, how those data are used, who uses it, and um, uh, how, how they themselves can be involved, potentially as citizen scientists, so that they can understand their own mental health outcomes and trajectories and be involved in that research agenda. So we have commissioned a collaboration by, uh, led by Sage Bio Networks in the States, which is a collaboration which involves academics in the UK and in South Africa and in India where we're doing a two-year feasibility trial of looking at different models about how young people, those are between the ages of 14 and 24, and in fact for this project it's mainly between the age of 16 and 24, how they can be actively involved in sharing their data about important aspects of their lives relevant to mental health, such as their mental health state, their life experiences, um, and, uh, and sleep and other behavioural experiences. But what are the models by which they can share that data and also control the access to that data from other researchers at the same time as trying to promote maximum accessibility for open science and best research going forward? So there are many aspects of this feasibility trial, but the two I want to share with you today are a qualitative study and a quantitative study. So the quantitative study is randomly allocating people across those three um, countries, uh, UK, India and South Africa, where young people are being randomly allocated to conditions where they have maximum control over what happens to their data, they have minimum control over what happens to their data, or, a, or another condition where they choose whether they want maximum or minimum control and how much burden they want to be involved in those decisions. And we're looking to see what impact that has in terms of um, engagement, in terms of their experience of it, and in terms of what happens in terms of the sort of data that gets generated and that can be used by researchers. There's then another arm, which is a qualitative study that then explores with people what it, what it takes to be involved, what they feel about their involvement in such a project as this, what models they would like explored, what are the different participation models we might have. And the whole project is run by a, a steering group that includes uh, panels of people with lived experience of mental health problem who come from the relevant age group who are co-creators with the other researchers on how this project is developed. So the project at a number of levels is a, a co-creation around different models of steward data stewardship in relation to mental health data. And uh, we are hoping that we will that the, the first people are being recruited to the trial as we speak, and we're hoping to have results uh, early next year. So I uh, wanted to share that with you. Really interested in hearing what other people's models are and um, happy to take any questions. Wow, that's a fascinating example, um, Miranda. Can you tell us a bit more about what the um, maximum and minimum controls look like, just kind of as an illustration, what might maximum control be versus minimum control? So uh, minimum control is uh, that, uh, that, that, that the consent involves that once your data is share, are shared, then researchers download it as according to protocols and the researchers can then do whatever they want with it. And it, and, and we don't control who the researchers can use it or what purposes they're used for. Mm. 
maximum control is where the, the people who are donating their data still have control, not just that they can, there, is, there are a ver variety of different conditions, but the two that I particularly remember, one is where they control who gets to download it. For example, it may be non-commercial people only, only if it's used for particular purposes, but then the researchers have decision. Or it could even be that the research is downloaded, but then still need to ask for permission from the participants about whether the research questions they're asking are appropriate, whether it can be used in that way, and whether that can be done, um, whether that can be uh, uh, used for the purposes that those young people want it used for. How interesting. And um, someone's asking in the audience, uh, how can people register to take part? And I would add to that question. Are you also looking at kind of demographics of registering and who chooses um, a hundred yeah, percent. We would yeah. love people to register to take part. Mm. It's called the Mind Kind Study. Mm. There's lots of details about it on our website. I'll try and make sure that I send it round also. But if you if you Google Mind Kind, M I N D K I N D, it's the Mind Kind Study, run by Sage Bio Networks. There's details on our website, but I think you can actually register through a, 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 a bespoke uh, area, and it is in the UK, South Africa, and India. Wonderful. I see Hannah's just added it to the chat. Final Thank question you. from me, and I'm sure there'll be others from the audience at the end of the session. Um, I assume that this uh, this particular study on um, data um, agency and control is only one small part of the larger mental health data bank, and, um, and you're also doing a lot of interesting research on the data itself. And I just um, wondered how you, you know, ha has that been... Um, how have you prioritized that in relation to the broader set of research that you're doing? It, it seems quite an, quite a novel and inspirational thing to think, could we build something like this into other research projects? But how has that been to prioritize it and, and resource-wise, how difficult has it been to build it into the study? So just to be clear, this study is, is purely about the feasibility of different models of engagement and empowerment, yep. because we yep. felt that was something that hadn't been looked at before and was sort mm -hmm. of foundational for anything else. So right. we are not assuming we will get rich mental health data out of this study. We may or may I not, see. but that mm -hmm. isn't our, our aim. Our I aim see. is about the feasibility, like exactly as you say, who signs up, who doesn't sign up, who do we lose? How does yeah, the engagement wonderful. work with young people? What's, it, what's the model? Separately from that, we are funding a number of cohort studies. We're looking at different ways that people collect data. And we are also launching a data prize um, uh, later this year. I think it's later this year, might be early next year, um, uh, which will get people to use existing data data sets to be able to analyze to look for for rich data insights so it's part of a wider program of work but this particular study is particularly focused on this structural issue right and uh, sorry this is so, so interesting and i could see some more questions coming through um someone from the audience is asking what i think is a very pertinent question which is are there ethical issues involved in how you randomize the participants allocation to either of the categories ha has that and is that something the lived experience panel has thought about and looked through. Um, and, and I suppose, again, it links to another question, which is kind of the structural inequalities and their link to mental health. So how have you kind of grappled with that? And is there a separate ethics body or ethics process that the, um, that the study is going through? So the study has gone through ethics boards in all mm. three geographies. Right. Um, and the lived experience panel have been involved in all aspects of the design uh, as have the researchers and we have ethicists working with us. Uh, Megan Doyle, who works for Sage Bio Networks, is a fantastic ethicist who's working with us on the project. So uh, this, is, this is absolutely central to what we're discussing and looking at. Great. Thank you so much, Miranda. We'll move on, but um, I'm sure there'll be other questions when we come back at the end of the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm really pleased now to introduce uh, Catherine Riley, who, as I said, is joining us from uh, Vancouver, so the west coast of the US. Um, and Catherine is an associate professor at Simon Fraser University and is going to talk to us about citizen-centered data audits. So over to you, Catherine. Um, actually, the west coast of Canada. Which I'm so Canadians sorry. Are. I'm sorry. Of course. <laughs> I zoned out as I was talking, my apologies. <laughs> Very important point. <laughs> Speaking of representation uh, and structural inequalities, I definitely <laughs> should not gloss over the difference between the US and Canada, my apologies. No worries. Um, thank you so much, uh, Rima, for inviting me to speak at this launch of this really important uh, report. I've had a chance to read it and I really um, want to promote it to everybody in the audience because it contains a wealth of examples and I think any of us who are working on trying to make uh, data systems more participatory are, are interested in seeing what other people are up to. 
Uh, Rima asked me to talk today about uh, my work on citizen data audits as a form of participation in data and information systems. And what I'd like to talk to you guys uh, about today is um, how in, in the work that I'm doing on citizen data audits in Latin America, how we go about placing data subjects at the center of the process. And that really starts from a mindset. Um, it's important in the work that we're doing. Uh, I should say that I'm working with partners in five countries in Latin America, uh, digital rights partners and uh, researchers. We start by thinking about data and information systems as relational social constructs. And then we reposition data subjects as mediating those constructs. So what do I mean by this? Um, what I mean is that um, first, we understand that data only takes on meaning in the context of an information system, and that those information systems are, of course, created by human beings in the context of social relations. So when we hear metaphors like data is the new oil, it seems to suggest that data is just out there floating around and it's ready to be harvested. And this seems to suggest that things like data security or data privacy are of primary concern when we talk about data stewardship. But um, that's not really how data becomes valuable in the data economy, um, data or in, in the data society. Data becomes valuable when someone organizes it to extract information or to manage social processes. I, for example, never give my name away. I always hold on to that piece of information that my name is Catherine Riley. Um, but the moment that I, for example, decide to move houses, my name suddenly becomes the ticket to a whole bunch of potential profits because I might hire a moving van or switch health providers or buy new furniture. And so suddenly my name signals a market opportunity. Um, that means that that piece of data, my name, has value in the context of housing, which we need to understand as a set of social services that is um, happening in the context of housing policy and the nature of the housing market and the context of historical processes like gentrification. So that's what I mean by saying that we need to understand data and information systems as relational social constructs. And secondly, um, talking about putting data subjects at the center of these processes, drawing on the work of um, the Colombian communication scholar, Jesus Martin Barbero, I think it's really helpful to rethink data subjects not as the source or the owner of data, but as actors who are mediating data and information systems. And that means that we determine how we understand those systems and whether and how we will use them. And we are responsible for evaluating how they shape our experience and making decisions about them. So um, this is much easier to do when we think of ourselves as being at the center of a socio-informational system rather than simply subjects of that system. So with this in mind, when I say a citizen-centered data audit, I, I, sorry, when I say a citizen-centered data audit, I'm not thinking in terms of the traditional definition of an audit. So that would be to verify whether a data manager is follow, following established standards. Rather, oh, sorry, we, we can, of course, do that type of work. And this is what ARCO laws facilitate. Um, but we'd really just be doing the government's job for it. And also, we'd be positioning ourselves as data sources. And so we'd be occupying a very narrow space for action. Rather, what I'm interested in is citizen-centered processes in the vein of work done uh, a few years ago by the Our Data Bodies Project in the United States. I'm very inspired by that work. So a citizen-centered process explores the lived experiences of people who engaged with an informationalized social system. Um, so for example, in, in the work that we're doing in Latin America, this includes things like access to online banking by recent immigrants in Chile, or access to contraceptives by young women in Lima. Uh, we work, what we do is we help these groups work out the gap between their values, desires, and needs on the one hand, and how information systems actually work. And this enables people to think about how they'd rather the information system functioned. And this is the basic process of audit that we carry out. So I'll share one example and then I'll wrap up. So one of the processes that we've developed is called El Desborde, and that means the flood. And it draws on the work of a Spanish theorist named Thomas Villasante. And um, the idea here is to think about data from the point of view of social engagement. What Bija Sante argues is that 
when we approach a social context, a social system, we have lots of different options. So when somebody, for example, applying this to the case of data, when someone asks me for my data, right, I go to log on to a system or I go to a, a bank and somebody asks me for my personal data, I have lots of options. I can just do what they ask, right? So I can just comply. Or I could try to subvert the system perhaps by providing false data or incomplete data. Or I can resist entirely and forego the service that's being provided. But a fourth option, and this is the one that Vija Sante focuses on, is to engage constructively. So um, that's what Elis Borde focuses on. It means to, um, uh, because it means a flood or an overflow, the idea is to identify how my needs exceed the parameters of the system. And then I can work out how the system would need to change to respond to my needs. So we have developed techniques that walk groups of people through this process and help them to think that through. So we learn a lot through these types of processes. For example, in the case of Chile, migrants find themselves in this really crazy catch-22 situation where online banking is concerned. They can't access online banking because they don't have an address but they can't get an address because they can't pay a deposit on an apartment uh, because they don't have a bank account. So the information systems in this case are most likely following the law to the letter if we were to audit them in terms of their privacy and, and all of those things, but they aren't serving the needs of a specific, and in this case, marginalized community. Um, meanwhile, in Peru, the work that we are doing with young women, um, they tell us that they really love actually being able to uh, order contraceptives online. Um, they can swing by the pharmacy on their way to the university to pick them up and their families with whom they live don't know what's going on and proves quite conservative where um, sexuality is concerned. So um, these women do, so, so they are happy to share their personal data if it means that they can be more sexually liberated. They do worry, however, that perhaps they aren't getting access to experts with whom they can discuss reproductive health. And they find that they get a lot of reproductive health information through social uh, networks rather than from a pharmacist because of the way that their relationship with the pharmacist is organized through these information systems. And so they actually wonder if more um, sharing of personal information would be better. And uh, they would actually like to see personal information expanded, health information, et cetera, because it would advance their sense of empowerment. So um, to conclude, um, I, I wanted to say that early, when I started this work of maybe four or five years ago, um, early data literacy projects were at that time finding that participants really didn't care how companies were using their data. So research was being done with young people and it would show them that, you know, Facebook was collecting all this data about them, et cetera. And, and people would kind of participate in these projects and go, eh, I'm not sure it really matters to me. But I think those projects were um, fundamentally flawed because I think they focused on voluntary spaces uh, like Facebook that, um, and, and, and the projects basically revealed the quantity of data flowing outwards towards corporate actors. And participants were asked to speculate about how this could affect them and um, to weigh those theoretical potential effects against the real benefits that they were already experiencing. And so they, they you know, on balance, they would say, oh, I'm not sure it really matters. But I think that we've come a long way in the last four or five years in, in thinking about how to work with communities on these types of questions. And when we start from people's real lived experiences and how they've actually been affected by datification or informationalization, in particular of social processes that they rely on, then people start to mediate information systems rather than the other way around. Through these community-centered audits, we discover that the design of information systems is affecting communities in concrete and often unexpected ways, and that those systems will have much better impacts if they are designed with the needs of the community in mind. Well, that's, thank you very much. That's, um, thank you so much, Catherine. Share. Really wonderful, what incredible work. And it's um, such an important illustration of how agency around data and data use is just a such more nuanced and contextual thing uh, than is often portrayed. We often hear these really blunt statements about whether people care about their privacy or not. But actually, I think what you're illustrating is uh, it's incredibly contextual and um, and dependent on a range of different circumstances. I'm interested in just in terms of the practicality of how you've run these audits, how do you go about 
translating your findings in a meaningful way for the data controller or data processor to be able to take action. So in the Chile example, for example, were you able or are you able to then communicate those findings to the banks or help to mediate some type of resolution to the issue? We are just uh, in the process of completing audits this fall, the, mm -hmm. the first round of this new sort of approach to doing audits. And this has been a pressing question for us as well. Mm. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that helps is that we're partnering with the sort of the chief um, data rights organization in each of the five countries where we're working. And they're very interested in taking these findings and publishing them and using them in their work. But um, I guess the, the broader question or the broader answer would be that we hope to sort of tack on a new phase of work and start to tackle that very question. Because if it's not linked, it, it, it is useful for people to have these skills from a data literacy point of view so that they can make decisions. But if they can't change those larger systems in a, in a, in a larger way, ultimately they are stuck with simply deciding um, do I participate in this or no, right? And we don't want people to be in that position. We want people to be able to engage constructively to create systems that are actually supporting, you know, positive social processes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you see a world in which these types of audits might ultimately be procured by providers themselves? Or do you think that they have to arise out of the community context? Or would you like to see data providers, controllers, like uh, encouraging or commissioning community-centered audits? I mean, ideally, yes, but it's going to it's going to be contextual because it depends on the power relation at work, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're talking mm -hmm. about a private sector organization that has different incentives for their use of personal data, then they are never going to um, initiate these processes mm -hmm. they're going or they're going to initiate those processes from their positionality and their positionality is one of maximizing efficiency and and mitigating risk right and mm -hmm. so um, there are always going to be contexts where that has to be asked for demanded forced and there mm -hmm. are going to be other contexts however where um it can very much be a partnership. So in a cooperative, for example, you can imagine that that's an ongoing um, process of monitoring and conversation between the participants in the space and the people who are managing, who are stewarding the data in that space. Yeah, yeah really interesting. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat that are linked to a similar issue, I think. So um, you're working in these community um, or citizen-led audits with often kind of marginalized or disadvantaged groups in particular, so migrants or young women procuring contraception in a conservative society. Do you, how do you think about empowerment for those groups in particular? Someone in the chat pointed out or in the Q&A pointed out that even Arnstein in her participation ladder noted that um, concerns around racial justice and how her ladder fails to take account of the lack of self-determination for black communities, for example. Um, and perhaps you consider these audits as a way of in improving self-determination, but I'm interested in how you've thought about that. And it links to another question, which is what kind of safeguarding concerns are relevant to when, to your thinking when you um, center minoritized data subjects or when you're thinking about involving them in these um, uh, citizen-led audits? Uh, it's very complicated how we define marginalized. Mm -hmm. So the women in Peru are actually... Um, white urban women who are mm -hmm. attending university. So while they are, you know, mm -hmm. uh, positioned in a particular way according to their agenda, socioeconomically they are not minorities within Peru. Similarly, the group we're working with in Uruguay is senior citizens who are accessing, you know, accessing healthcare through digital systems. And uh, while they are senior citizens and they face particular challenges, they are actually people who are within their society quite advantaged. So it's complicated how we think about that in the context of data and information systems. That's the first thing I wanna say. The second thing I wanna say is that it's really critical that we start from the experience of people. This is one of the things I really love about the Our Data Bodies Project because it really starts from the physical experience of um, Latino and black communities in the United States. 
um, within urban settings and their physical experience of being, you know, seeing cameras put up in their communities and saying, well, what's being recorded and how does that change my behavior and how does that make me feel? And so when we start from um, people's lived experiences, like how did you feel when you went to the bank and they asked you for this information and you couldn't provide it, um, then um, we really, you know, are, are centering those people as you say and i think i missed one other question was there a third question there no i think that's right we, the question was around safeguarding and i think you you spoke about that as a, as part of the design really of the whole system there is a question about i think uh connecting those two questions together and i've had this question in the past which is if you center those groups of people and they reveal their feelings are you and their experiences are you simply providing um, information to, to data managers, data power holders that allow them to further secure their power over the data. And I think that is a real concern. There has to be care about the relationship between the data holder and the, and the people who are expressing concerns, because otherwise you're just doing work for private corporations who want to figure out how to further incorporate uh, people into their information mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. So we have to be a bit careful about that for sure. That's interesting. Thank you so much. I could keep probing. It's such an interesting project, but I'm going to um, turn to our final speaker, if that's okay. Um, and that is Gary Leeming, um, who's running the Liverpool Civic Data Trust. And Gary, please tell us more about the project. We're excited to hear. Um, sure. Yeah. And I mean, first, again, sort of thanks for the invite and, and to echo uh, Catherine and Miranda's comments about the report. Um, it's excellent. And certainly from, from my perspective, very timely as we're um, very much at the start of the journey of setting up uh, the Liverpool Civic Data Cooperative. It, it kind of gives us a, a good toolkit to start working from. So um, that's uh, really exciting for us. Um, for for me, um, you know, my background is I've been working on um, what's called learning health systems for a number of years. Um, so looking at how we can better use data in healthcare to reduce something what we call the data action latency. That is the time it takes between having the data and actually having a system that allows us to act on that data in a way that improves people's care. Um, and, and I think that one of the biggest challenges there has been governance and how we um, sort of enable people in terms of their ownership of their own data, both in terms of the clinicians as well as the patients and the organisations that sort of wrap around all of these infrastructures. And, you know, um, for me, also this goes back to sort of thinking about this idea of patient activation, um, which was shown to, you know, if you give patients information about their condition, involved in the decisions that they're making about their own care then they their, their health improves because they they understand more about what's happening and they're more directly involved in it as well um, and i think this idea of for me of research activation or data activation is something that you know very much looking at from from the perspective of the cooperative cooperative um, and you know recognizing that now you know, as, as of now we're, we're pretty lucky in liverpool in that we've been able to create this as a collaboration between our residents the university where i'm based uh, the nhs and the multiple organizations that, that are a part of that as well as the, the local metropolitan government who funded the whole piece um, to create this really this new kind of, of uh, civic data platform um, sort of inspired by ideas such as those described in this report, ideas from the Mozilla Foundation, the ODI, as well as existing examples like the Salas Co-op in Barcelona, My Data in Switzerland, and um, technical platforms like Solid, which uh, have been developed by Tim Berners-Lee. Um, and I think within all those projects, I think we'll face a similar challenge around how do we scale something like this? How do we scale people's involvement? Um, you know, people have been very well trained to feel disempowered when it comes to data and, and, and so we need to find mechanisms to support our engagement with our residents, address that in both our involvement and empowerment of them, while also accepting that there is you know, uh, a huge gap in terms of digital inclusion and education and the need to really address that power imbalance that um, yeah, certainly I think Catherine was talking about there in terms of how our data are used and how we have the involvement that we have in how our data are used. So, I mean, our, our key sort of mission 
sort of statement, I guess, as it were, is um, that, you know, we want to give our residents, our citizens, a way to, to use their data and support others in using their data in order to create positive change for the, for the city region. And we're looking in this at promoting data more as a commons resource and moving away from that data as oil narrative. And models like things like microfinancing cooperatives that are, are quite popular, uh, are increasingly um, used uh, in uh, uh, many areas to support people getting access to safe and secure finance are these models that maybe we can sort of help with how we think about data moving from a very disempowered state to uh, mechanisms that mean that our, our residents actually have more say in how their data are used. Through that, we build collaborative partnerships in digital health and care and the, the wider civic environment um, across this what is a tremendously large number of stakeholders. You know, um, GP practices alone, we have hundreds, you know, that, that all have um, um, uh, responsibilities under GDPR and, and confidentiality towards their patients that we have to respect. So we need to find a way to sort of balance that with, with, with citizen need. And ultimately then hopefully to create this idea of a culture of open innovation so that we can share these across both the region and, and, and beyond. Um, as I said, um, we were fairly sort of near the start of this whole process. Although we've been, um, um, we've kind of had a bit of a soft start at the start of the year, the pandemic has slowed us down a little bit, but it has allowed us to, um, on the one hand, think about what our design principles are and our theory of change in terms of what are the outputs that we want to affect. And you can find those via our website at civicdatacooperative.com. Um, it's all very uh, bare bones at the moment, uh, so please bear with us. Um, but we've also been working, you know, on the pandemic with within our integrated care system to support things like our local shared care record cipher and how that responds to challenges such as the testing program that was done in Liverpool, the reopening of events and making sure that the citizen voice and learning from the challenges that our citizens face are recognised and brought into the thinking that we have. So, you know, as an example, you know, the, even on the testing program, you know, we had people who were turning up with their phones. You know, I'm sure everybody's done an LFT on this call where, you know, you, you, you turn up with your phone, you have to register with the NHS website. You know, those were things that we had to provide a great deal of support for significant numbers of our population. So what we find is when you look at the raw stats that say 95% of people have mobile phones, that's not taking into account things like what are their data plans? How are they paying for it? Are they able to use or navigate websites that maybe are written in languages that are overly complex or, or with processes that don't necessarily make sense um, uh, to, to, to people uh, without you know, some kind of instruction or training? So on the back of that now, I think we're getting to the really exciting part. And this is where, you know, one part of that actually is our partnership with Involve and Adel of Lace to uh, co-design with our citizens and our stakeholders to what these models for governance and engagement will look like and how do we grow and um, develop the sustainable participatory civic data infrastructure over this next five years that we're funded for and also beyond. You know, we, we recognise that this is an infrastructural programme. It takes a long time to establish, you know, to, in, in years to sort of build this type of thing. So things that we've identified as being uh, really important, at the, you know, to, to understand right at the start right now are things like that we have a social license to act, that, you know, that, that we're, it's recognised that we're not doing to, we're doing with, that we have clearly identified benefits and outcomes that we're looking to deliver on for all this as well, that this isn't just a yet another data project, that we have perceived benefits for participating and that they outweigh any risks of participating. So things like confidentiality are really important in it. It's, it's um, you know, things like the COPE notice in the NHS, which is put aside the duty of confidentiality while we respond to the pandemic. That's 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 great, but we really need to sort of, you know, that, that confidentiality is there for a reason. And we need to build that trust. We need to have things that are measurable and generated from lived experience. So what I usually refer to ground truth, but it's basically that, you know, from, from what, are, what are people's experiences within that. And we need to make sure that most marginalised voices are, are sort of heard and that we're not just focused on the sort of sexy end of artificial intelligence and use of data. We're not just thinking about the algorithms, but we're thinking about what are these foundational requirements on how the data are used and those challenges like bias in the data or that the use of it reflects the voices and needs of all of our residents. And so while we might not know right now how 
any data cooperative can really work at scale and with this level of trust. We hope that ours will be a, a part of that local voice in that in that national and international movement of um, creating these new models of, of the use of data and creating uh, transparent and open tools that everybody else can adapt and use and feed back to us on and help us to improve our own things so that we can build these clear diameters of trust in which we're, we're sort of working. So thank you. Thank you so much, Gary, and um, exciting to hear about this project uh, right at the beginning and, and Ada's looking forward to being involved. Um, a few questions from the audience and, and myself as well, some, some of which are quite practical. So some people are wondering who are the members of the cooperative? Uh, so are they the partner organisations, GP surgeries, or are they the individuals themselves? Is the, the, the cooperative a traditional cooperative by, whereby each member is a co-owner? Um, and then I suppose um, a question in the back of my mind is if um, what is the individual level engagement with uh, data subjects? And I think I'm, I suppose I'm, I'm have in my mind uh, the backdrop of the GP data um, uh, proposal that the NHS, um, NHS Digital rolled out earlier in the year. And here, for those not based in the UK, there was the proposal to centralise a range of GP data for the purpose of research. And there was quite a lot of pushback for that because of the way in which the process was rolled out. Um, and some of that was contingent on it being an opt-out rather than an opt-in um, initiative. So I'm just wondering how are you grappling with the issues of uh, individual subject involvement and, and participation in the co-op against that backdrop? So I, I, this is something that I've been really wrestling with actually, and it is a really big challenge because I, the, I, I don't, it, when we think of data co-ops, I think we, we kind of immediately leap to this idea that everybody's kind of giving consent and that, and, and, and that um, everybody's kind of you know, choosing how the data are used. And I think, you know, Miranda's project is, is um, a really great example, I think, of trying to understand what are those challenges around that. Because each time you're asking somebody to give permission to use their data, you're kind of creating a barrier for them to participate. Um, and, and it's finding that right balance that is a part of the challenge. So although it's maybe a little bit of a sort of wishy-washy answer right now, I think part of it is I, I don't really know. And, and what we need to do is to, um, over the next few months working with yourselves and the involved is actually is get out there and understand you know what 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 are what are people in terms of our organizations and and, and everything else. Um, what, what do they want? What, what, what can they do? What, what, what is the appetite for this? And what maybe would improve that participation? In terms of specific membership, um, I mean, at the moment, we, we consider our stakeholders to be um, organisations, um, but they, um, uh, and they will have a say. We haven't formally decided to, to become a cooperative at this point in time because we want to decide on what that model needs to look like. I would love it if we could have a, a truly cooperative model of, 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 of membership and ownership. Um, and I think that's really where we want to head to. But it's probably too big a step to start from right now with the complexity around some of the governance and, and, and data controllership and so on in, in our organisations. So that's where what we're looking to do is to understand the steps from where we are to how we get to there over the next few years. Sorry, apologies. You're right. It's an incredibly complex situation because the sense is that when it comes to health data, um, people's expectations that certain things are being uh, done aren't being met. So they expect that their health data is being used in particular ways and particularly to improve services to them, but then also not being used in other ways. And as we've said a few times throughout this, given the kind of missteps in 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 the field and more broadly outside of the field just generally with data there's a real sense of distrust or at least at the very least confusion or or un misunderstanding about how data is being used so it's a really complex uh challenge that you face and organizations i mean like understanding patient data and the project yeah. projects that i worked with connected health cities before you know we've had citizen juries that have looked at a lot of these issues 
and I've generally found people quite positive towards it. So I can understand something like an, an organization mm. like a digital going, well, people want this to happen. So yeah. sure, we can just do it. And, and look, we even did some good things in uh, during COVID. And I think there is a real then surprise that that um, that you know, there is this sort of sudden backlash because it doesn't form a part of it. There's no ongoing consultation. There's no ongoing participation. Mm. And the thing right at this stage i think the commitment to the cooperative is about making sure that we are having that commu that communication and that communication is also informing and changing how then we're using the data um a a across liverpool um mm. and, and how we're changing the governance that, that that supports that as well so that you know it, it's not it's not a static here you know this is what we sort of think that it is part of that ongoing conversation mm. and i think you mentioned right at the start the focus on benefits and demonstrable benefits to individuals. Certainly the work that we did with understanding patient data a couple of years ago on health data partnership shows that people do want to see that uh, demonstrable health benefits being delivered with their data. And actually the, the public work we did around COVID equally showed that a willingness to give over data should it tangibly and uh, and demonstrably result in in out, better outcomes around the pandemic. So it's so important to, as you say, have an ongoing engagement and keep telling that story. There's a really provocative um, presentation because there's lots of questions coming up here and I'm, I'm also um, keen to finish on time, which is four minutes. I wanted to turn one final question back to Rima, actually. There's a lot of uh, conversation in the chat about um, whether or not uh, participation is just a way of I suppose, um, kind of green lighting data collection anyway, you know, data that, and people are saying, well, how do we make people more involved in pati genuine participation at the point of collection? I don't know if you, if you have an answer to that, but I wanted to give you a chance given that it came up a couple of times. And then a final one that I'm sure you can answer shortly, which is someone has pointed out that, you know, how should we, how should we compensate people for their involvement in participatory initiatives? So um, the first thing I would say is that we do engage with this issue extensively in the report and in particular uh, the notion of what I describe as participation wash, which I think is what people are referring to. And I come back to that Arnstein um, quote around real power needed to affect the outcome of a process, so clarity about expectation um, and also just some clarity about who it is that has power to, to shape what's happening. I think that's really important. Um, the point about collection and the life cycle um, is, is really relevant and that also um, involves decision making about whether that form of data infrastructure or um, uh, decision making should go ahead in the, in, in the first instance. There's a really um, uh, extensive passage in the report about that as well. Um, and uh, the, the, the question um, of, of participation watch is a really interesting one because um, it, invites us to reflect on who it is that has the power to affect the change in that process. There's also a set of questions around um, uh, 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 structural inequalities and whether this framework adequately um, kind of helps us to think about structural inequality. And um, the, the, the point about the empower end of the spectrum is also really, really interesting. So um, who is it in that instance that got, got got power and uh, how do you shift the dynamics in the ecosystem um, and data governance eco ecosystem to ensure that there is um, a greater range of agency to, for, for individuals to um, articulate what good looks like and, and do that in, in, a, in a particular way. But there's a real tension there though um, which Gary um, uh, flagged which is how do you do that in a way that doesn't in and of itself raise and increase the barriers to, to participation. So um, it's one of those things I think I would describe as a wicked problem here. I don't think it's impossible to solve, but it is uh, probably one for another conversation. Thank you, Rima. And just really quickly, as we wrap up, I, I might just make the point that um, at least at the Lovelace Institute, we do compensate participants for participating in um, some of our public deliberation initiatives and make sure we're paying people for our time because as the person who asked the question uh, pointed out, people are very tired of giving over their lived experience, which is another form of data, of course, for free. And it is really important that, you, that you're um, compensating people for that. 
in the interest of time, I will wrap up. But thank you so much, Miranda, Catherine and Gary, for a really interesting conversation. Um, I was so thrilled to hear about all three of your initiatives, such wonderful examples. And they so perfectly illustrate the research that Rima has put into the report. Um, please uh, do all go and have a look at that report. And thank you so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate having you here and really uh, quite a considerable number of you. It's great to see the interest and the clear engagement with the issue in the chat and the Q&A. Um, please do continue to follow us at Ada Lovelace Inst and uh, we really hope to see you again in our next event. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.